You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the KTPF Reload Show. In case you're wondering what the Reload Show is about, if you haven't heard previous shows, these are the interviews that were conducted by good friends of mine, Stephen and Sue Taggart, in the days of the KTPF Radio Show. Their own radio show ran for just over four years, broadcasting every week for over three hours. I joined them in the last 18 months of the show's run, but eventually the guys felt they'd just about had enough. It was a monumental effort to keep broadcasting every week for three hours. It was a wonderful show. But... Unfortunately, they're no longer involved, and the shows have just sort of sat in the archives, so I thought it would be nice to bring them back to life and bring you the interviews that the guys conducted over those four years. They include some of the most interesting people within the world of the paranormal and some not so well known, but still, nevertheless still very interesting. We even have one or two rather unusual shows, including a live seance and um, other things along those lines. Anyway, hopefully you enjoy tonight's show, and this is the KTPF Reload Show. Enjoy. This program deals with themes of an adult nature and is intended for a mature audience. They've landed. You're in the right place. Flourish. Online, on the web, and on air. All over the world. Talk radio. You hear us, we hear you. Yeah, good evening and welcome to another evening for another relaxed show on the KGPF Community Talk Show Live. My name is Suzanne. And I'm Steve. And we're here to bring you another night of weird and wonderful. Right, so um, let me just give you an idea of what's going on tonight. So, pup between the coughing and spluttering. Um, we've got a young lady all the way from Austin, Texas, that's going to be talking to us via Skype. Um, her name is Rob... Roberta Grimes. Roberta is an Austin-based um, business attorney who had two ex- extraordinary experiences of light in childhood that prompted her to spend decades studying nearly 200 years of abundant and consistent communications from the dead. Uh, Roberta shares many of her discoveries in her latest books, The Fun of Dying, Find Out What Really Happens, and its sequel, The Fun of Staying in Touch which do details more, uh, some astonishing recent events in the field of afterlife communications. We're going to contact Roberta now, which says she's away, which I'm hoping she isn't. <laughs> Listen, and, and can I say, R- Roberta is the happiest soul we've ever spoken to. She sounds very, very happy in herself, she does. doesn't she? Uh, that's Roberta we're talking about. <laughs> Are you there, Roberta? Hi, yes. We're just it's saying so that you, you seem a happy soul when we speak to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, but how can you not be happy? Because everything is good. It turns out all the things we used to worry about, we don't have to worry about now. Well, hopefully you're going to convince everybody tonight. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, Roberta. Um, well, I'm so we've got a so few glad people to be in the here. chat room. Um, hopefully they'll have some questions for you a bit later on. But uh, first of all, can you tell us a bit about yourself, Roberta? Well, I'm a business attorney. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a wife of 42 years and a mother of three and a grandmother of five. Uh-huh. And I'm a perfectly ordinary person, except that I've always had a rather unusual hobby, which has been investigating what happens at and after death. Right. Okay. Now, you've studied this quite a lot, haven't you? Um, you've um, you've really looked into this, haven't you? Um, and I, you've, I've spent my life doing it, and I'm in my 60s. Right. <laughs> so I've well, so when done did it you forever. Actually, when did you actually start, Roberta? When I was in my 20s. In your 20s. And and is this all spurred from um, 
I believe you had uh, um, a light experience when you were a child. I did. I was well, when I was eight, which was in April of 1955. I woke up in the middle of the night and knew there was no God, and I was terrified. And as I was becoming terrified, there was this brilliant flash of white light in the room, which shone on the wallpaper and the toys, so I remember to this day what that room looked like. And a young male voice said, you wouldn't know what it is to have me unless you knew what it is to be without me. I will never leave you again. Mm -hmm. Now, when you're eight, because everything is surprising, nothing really is surprising, I thought it was really handy. If you forget there's a God, they remind you. And I went about my life thinking that I would hear from someone. At some point, you learn, you know, you learn the facts of life. You learn to drive a car. At some point, you learn what happens if you forget there's a God. But, of course, I, I never did learn. Um, and so I eventually I had to figure it out for myself, and that's when I started doing this research. So how, you say you felt a bit scared when you found out there was no God. Um, obviously some people, um, or most people, they believe in God and, and the doctrines of, of what's going on there and, and about life um, and through Jesus Christ and everything. Um, how, how do you, how do you uh, actually look at it now? Well, I w when I say I realized there was no God, what I felt was a, a spiritual hollow where there never had one been one before. And yeah. I believe that the voice was my spirit guide who had withdrawn so I, and then come back so I would know the difference. I yeah. think that's really what happened. Uh -huh. um, I don't believe in the Christian God either. No. The Christian God does not exist. What exists is an extremely powerful energy that brings forth the universe, and our minds are part of that energy. That's what really exists. I don't even call it God because the word God puts so many negative connotations in our minds. Now, but it's real. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real energy, and our minds are part of it. So our minds are eternal. We never began. We never will end. I, I, I very much agree with that. <laughs> I really <laughs> That's do. What, thank you. Thank you for that support. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I mean, they're, they're lovely, sto lovely parables, and uh, they try and teach us a lesson, but that's it. It's, uh, with, with, what I've discovered is that it's Jesus told us things 2,000 years ago about God, reality, death, and the afterlife that we could not have confirmed until the, at least the early 20th century. 95% of what he says in the Gospels, I can show you what he meant from the afterlife evidence. But Christianity doesn't follow the Gospels really at all. Jesus never says that God is so unloving that he had to come and die for our sins. Jesus says God is infinite love, and that turns out to be right. God doesn't judge us. We've never, no one doing this research has ever found a single instance of God judging anybody. No, no one has. Sorry, uh, carry on. Well, I just, I just wanted to say, and no one has ever found an instance where Jesus needed to be uh, our redeemer. No one has found an instance where someone couldn't go to the next level because mm. he wasn't a Christian. It just, all those things are not true. So if that's how you feel about it, why do you actually, you, I notice that most, um, that all your chapters start off with uh, quotes and you always have one there from Jesus. Why, why is that? I think that the most important person who ever has walked the earth is Jesus. Uh -huh. Because Jesus told us things 2,000 years ago that had to have come directly from God. And now we can confirm what he meant. So he is very, 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 very important. Right. Christianity okay. is not right. Christianity does not follow Jesus really at all. It's a coincidence, apparently, that they've chosen to use his name. Um, but Jesus, I, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm not a Christian. Right, okay. So we'll start off. Um, you wrote your first book, um, The Fun of Dying, um, What Happens Next? I haven't read it yet. I'm, I'm getting through it, but um, so I can't really comment much on there. But um, what made you decide to write that one? In um, April, uh, April seems to be my month for some reason. In April of 2009, uh -huh. I decided that since I'd had such a wonderful life, and I and you know I had figured all this out by then, um, I decided I would give my life to God, whatever was left of it. So I started praying a gratitude affirmation. I started praying a couple times a day, thank you for giving me work to do, thank you for showing me how to do it. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not praying from lack. I'm praying from the abundance of the fact that I know there's something I'm supposed to be doing. I just, you know, thank yeah. you for showing me what it is. Yeah. By August, I had started to write that book, and I had no idea that I even was going to write a book. It just started happening. And and that's the same way the fun of staying in touch came as well. Uh, I knew that there was going to be a book called that someday, and then one day I suddenly started writing it. <laughs> if, uh -huh. if you If you allow God to do it, um, and I again, I'm sorry to say, God, if you allow eternal mind yeah. to do it, yeah, you, you will find that you have wonderful work to do that you had no idea you were going to do, but it's so much better than anything you could think up yourself. So um, one of the first questions I need to ask you is, I'll be truthful with you, when, when I was advertising what was happening tonight, you know, in our interview, um, you, you class yourself as an afterlife expert. People were saying what makes you the expert. Can you explain that for me? We, the only reason that I'm a, quote, expert is that I have devoted my life to trying to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. We have a, abundant and consistent communications from the dead, the best of which were received between 1900 and 1950. Mm -hmm. Most people are not even aware that these communications exist. But there was an effort around the turn of the previous century by the dead to make their, their presence known to us. Um, and the evidence received then was so good, so consistent, so amazing, that if mainstream science had not decided to turn itself into a belief system, but it had instead open-mindedly studied the evidence, everybody living, everybody listening now would have known from birth that our minds are eternal. But because this was such good evidence and scientists didn't want to touch it, uh, they made atheism a fundamental dog. <laughs> Anything with a dogma is a religion. It's a belief system. Yeah. So at that point, about 100 years ago, mainstream science went off the rails. But first I've studied, to finish answering how I became an expert, first I spent decades reading hundreds and hundreds of communications from dead people, looking for as many as I could possibly find that were received before 1950. Then I've looked at quantum physics, because the physics of the afterlife is very different from the physics uh, of, of this level of reality, but quantum physics gives us insights and helps help us understand that it really is a plug between this level and most of reality, and, and I've looked at what consciousness researchers are showing us, little facts from science, big facts from science, all fit together, and when we put them together, we find not only what death is, how it happens, what our minds are, what, what happens after death, but we also learn that we've really discovered a whole new physics. The physics that will be dominant by the end of this century is consciousness-based. That's where the theory of everything will come from, and we, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I feel so bad. People for now are stuck with non-physicists because physicists are so determined to have physics have, have reality be physical that they refuse to even look at the possibility that the the unifying theory is going to be consciousness but it will be that day will come right um i've been asking here from andy where do you find the evidence well before about 1975 it was not easy to mm. find um evidence of the afterlife okay. um but then at that point um, Raymond Moody wrote Life After Life where he coined the term near-death experiences and that started an interest in death which was great because we started to get some good books which the great thing about these books was they all had bibliographies and those bibliographies led me to other books which led me to other books and I started to discover all this wonderful material that had been received a hundred years ago I mean I had to buy some of these books you know, as rare books, and this, of course, is before the Internet, so it was difficult to track them down. Others have been reprinted, but it's it's relatively easy. In the, in the back of the fun of dying and the fun of staying in touch, um, I give about 70 books, which if someone reads them or even reads a number of them, mm -hmm. you'll know everything I know. I mean, I'd love everybody to know all the stuff that I know. There's no earthly reason um, that any of this should be secret because it's the greatest news you could possibly come across. Your mind is eternal. Infinite mind is so perfectly loving. You are the most best beloved child of an infinitely powerful eternal mind. How could any better be any news be better than that? Well, I must admit, it got me thinking, to be honest with you, and um, 
I don't know whether people will agree with me or not, uh, but um, I did voice my opinion to one of my friends on Facebook. Um, and I spoke to Steve about it as well the other night. It sort of came to me like, I don't know, like you do. <laughs> um, made me think that technically, when it comes to your body, your your brain is like the battery and your heart is the, is the engine, so to speak, because it's pumping and what have you. But I couldn't comprehend where everything you learn through life can be can be trapped in one muscle, so to speak. So it's not. I'm wondering, right. like you say, it makes me wonder um, about where all this knowledge is going to. It can't just be stuck in that that blob that's stuck in your head, you know. So you're right. You know, so I'm thinking about this consciousness, as you call it in the book, you know, um, and it's making me feel as though, you know, that sort of, um, uh, for want of a better word, that ether or whatever is what, what goes on into life, if you understand what I mean. Yes, yeah. Uh, um, the, the thing is, you're, you're basically, your brain is like a two-way radio in the head of a meat robot. Yeah. Um, which is very much like the blue body that Jake had in the um, movie Avatar, if anyone has seen that movie. Um, your your mind is safe in eternal mind. Your mind is nowhere near your body. Your body is picking up the signal from your mind and is transmitting signals back to your mind. And it's in your mind that your your mind is very powerful. You have very little access mm. to it while you're in a body. Your body limits that access. Uh -huh. The dead, for example can easily manipulate matter. They can make objects appear and disappear. They can move matter. All of this done is done with their minds. They're much more powerful than we. We'll be that way too once we also are dead. But the body is a limiter. But you're absolutely right. Your, your memories are not stored in your brain. Um, it, it, there's so much evidence that our, our brains do not generate consciousness but instead receive it. The evidence is so abundant that the fact that scientists do not admit it is, is making them ridiculous um, to, to, to keep insisting that the earth is flat when there's so much evidence that that's just not true. Yeah. Uh, it is, it, again, they're, they're in the bushes now. They're off the, off the trail altogether, and they're floundering, trying to keep this illusion that they've got going a bit longer so they can finish their careers because nobody wants to be the one who, who gets to the age of 40 and discovers everything he's studied his whole life is basically wrong. No, this is it. And um, there's a lot of people that are hoping that there is something there when they do die, you know, that they will meet up with their loved ones. Um, yes, and, and they will. They and, absolutely will. That's 100%. And guaranteed. You, you can guarantee it. <laughs> yes, no, yes. That, that's, that's like, um, that's one big... Uh, announcement there isn't it really guarantee yes yes, yes. I, I mean it, it's it, it's so obvious to anybody who has given a little time even to looking at the evidence I'm meeting more and more people who also have had my unusual hobby and when I meet them we complete each other's sentences we've all achieved precisely the same conclusions I, I do podcasts, which are weekly. If you go to iTunes, they're available for free. Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes, because we all should be seeking reality for heaven's yeah. sake. Yeah. And and um, the the I I have guests on who talk about these topics. I never interview them ahead of time. No. I don't have to know what they're going to say because I know already what they're going to say. Yeah. And and I've never found anyone who's reached other conclusions than what I have once they've done the research. No. I it sounds a bit. I, I'm not. I'm not dissing here, but it's it, it's kind of a nice thing to believe. Uh, uh, and and if you're wrong, it doesn't really matter because you, if there's nothing there, it's just <laughs> you won't, won't be available to moan at it. It's yeah. Sort of thing. <laughs> I mean, it's not just. It's any belief, really. Yeah. At the end of the day, you can you can take whatever makes you feel. Uh, at ease. At ease with yeah. yourself, and because yeah. it doesn't really matter. Because at the end of the day, if when you die, there's nothing there. Then who who are you going to moan it, at? It, like it's impossible for your mind to die. Your mind right. cannot die. It never began, and it never will end. It is part of eternal mind, and that being the case, 
I, I, it changes all of life from a tragedy to a comedy. I mean, life could be tragic. You know, we, we have all these dreams and hopes, and then we turn into dust, and where is it? I mean, what was the point of even going through that? Yeah. Well, yeah. it turns out that the point is we are here to learn lessons. We plan a lifetime just as you'd plan a, a, you know, a rough day in school, and you learn the lessons, and then you go home to where we spend 99.9% .9 of eternity which is a long time, so we need a we need a sort of place to go and play, and yeah. it's a beautiful place. Oh my goodness, much better than anyone has ever ever imagined and told you. Well, David Lloyd's joined us, and he's asked where he said it's an interesting chat, by the way, and uh, he would like to know if you are aware of Anthony Peake's um, um, and his work, where he's he has said the penal gland. Is possibly being it is possibly being the gateway to the spiritual realms. What what is the gateway? Uh, the pineal gland. The pineal gland. The, the, yes, yeah. The the, yeah. the the pineal gland is one of the uh, <laughs> chakras, and I know very little about chakras. Mm -hmm. I'm very much a one trick pony. Death and the period right after death. That's my area of study. Yeah. Um, but in fact, um, it's a very important chakra. Someone taught me that if you imagine energy concentrating there uh, and then you project spiritual light out into the room, you can and, and send it to people that you love, you actually can, can raise them spiritually. And I experimented with this some years ago, and I found that it seems to work. But again, I, it's not an area I've really, really focused right. um, my thought on. Okay. There, there, there doesn't seem to be a part of the body that matters when it comes to uh, the period, you know, actual death and the period right after death. It seems to be just a perfectly natural process that the, the energetic interior part of our we're, we're built like a Matryoshka doll. We're, we're built with nested bod energy bodies, one mm -hmm. of which is visible. That's what we think of as material, but it's still only energy. The, the ones that are interior to, to the physical, what looks like a physical body, um, roll up into your chest and then leave either through the top of the head or through the chest. And it feels, it's easy and it's fun and it's enjoy. People who have been through it say it's a deliciously pleasurable feeling to leave the body. And it, it from then on, it is nothing but fun. I mean, the, the titles of my book really understate the reality. Now, it, it's, you tell it's the most fun you've ever had. Yeah. It, it sounds like you're describing uh, astral travel. Well, yes, during your lifetime, you go through a similar process. The difference is that when you're tra and, and by the way, everybody does it. Some people can astral travel consciously. Most of us just do it in our sleep. But we meet with our guides, we meet with our loved ones, we do, you know, take courses. We do a lot of stuff while our bodies sleep. And then we go back into our bodies um, and, and, and then they wake up. But um, what, what the difference is that there's what the, what the Bible calls a silver cord, a, an energy cord that attaches that energy body to, the, to the, what we think of as the physical body and keeps us, you know, keeps it, it alive while we're out of it. Mm -hmm. When we're ready to die, what had been a very tough cord that would let you go to the end of the universe in your, when, when your body was sleeping. I mean, you could go anywhere with, with, when you're traveling out of body. But when, you're, when it's time for you to die, that cord just frays. You, yeah. You've left your body and the cord frays and disintegrates, and that's that. Now, um, when you do die, um, is, is, a sub, is a question that's um, from Ghost Rider, who, which is something that I've always thought about. Um, Steve's nan, she was married two or three times sort of thing in life. Um, and he's asking, can you choose which family members to meet after your death? So absolutely, it, you know, yeah. is that possible? Oh yes. The with, the only thing that matters, whether here or there, is love. Mm -hmm. It love matters there so much that if there is a loving connection between you and anyone, that that affinity draws you together. If there's not a loving connection, you can avoid all contact. Wow. It it's you know the the Bible says that that. Question? Death, death ends marriage, and it certainly does. There, there's no marriage there, but people who have been loving spouses in this lifetime will often choose to spend a lot of time together or live together. Yeah. Uh, in the afterlife, it's just optional. You don't have to do it. Now, you've contacted um, dead loved ones, haven't you? Of course. And, and you do that 
I believe you do that between yourself. You know, you don't use a medium or anything, and you don't call oh, no. yourself a oh, no. medium. Oh, no, I have to. I have to use a medium. You have to what, use a medium. One of the things that we all need to do is determine which gifts to develop. And I decided <laughs> early on that my job was to be a dry researcher. I'm, a, I'm an attorney. I understand how to, how to use evidence and how to build a case. And if I were telling you, oh, most of this I got, you know, through my, my guides and angels, and you'd say, oh, well, airy fairy stuff, it doesn't matter. So I only look at facts. I don't, I, I, I've determined not mm -hmm. to be psychic. Um, which is not to say that I, I, we all are psychic. We all have the latent ability to yeah. connect directly with our loved ones. Um, but I, I tell them, you know, use the phone <laughs> because yeah. I'm not just not going to do it directly. Um, it's certainly on a, not on a conscious level. So, so to use one of the um, the titles of your chapter, um, one of your chapters in your book, um, your the one we're giving away tonight, which will be. Uh, getting you to pick a number between 1 and 27. <laughs> um, why is communication between the dead and the living so difficult? Well, you have to understand what, what, it, the, what reality actually is. There are at least six levels of higher vibratory energy realities that exist exactly where this one is. And the easiest way to imagine how that's possible is to think of your television set. Your mind is like that television. Right now, it's tuned to what we think is the lowest vibratory rate of reality. This, what we think of as a material level, and it's tuned to that body on this material level. When you die, all it does is to change channels, up three or four, and it picks up a whole new solid, solid reality in the same place. Mm -hmm. So it's for us to communicate with the dead is very much like your Channel 4 newsman talk to your Channel 7 newsman when they're both live on air and they don't have a cell phone in hand. It's not possible. They're on different energy, different different channels. Yeah. So what, what happens in order to make communication possible is that the dead, it's, you, you can go lower with your vibratory rate, your, your, your mind's vibratory rate. You really can't go higher with, except with great difficulty. And they tell us it's really impossible. So your spiritual level of development determines where you are in terms of the levels you can reach in the afterlife. Most people can at least get to level three. That's where I think most of us actually enter the afterlife. It's beautiful, by the way. So what, what happens is that our, our dead loved ones, because they love us, that affinity draws them to lower their vibratory rate and be very close to us. So they're right, they're right here around us, it, it, whatever they choose to be, and they can read our minds, yes, and it's all very cozy, but they need to be able to make their, their presence known to us. And that's very difficult. Um, I talk in the fun of staying in touch about the ways that they've developed over millennia, apparently, um, to to give us signs of their survival. Some of them are very dramatic. I mean, to have them, able, you know, literally appear in front of you is pretty spectacular. And the evidence is that close to 50 percent of spouses will see a vision of the dead spouse within the first year after the death. So some of them are spectacular. But they're still fighting that vibratory difference, which yeah. is which has is the reason why we're having so much trouble. We're working hard, or actually the dead are the ones working the hardest, to come up with an electronic means of communication. We call it a soul phone. Because once that happens, these Luddite scientists will no longer be able to, de to deny the fact that our minds are eternal. And that's going to make it a lot easier for everybody else to go ahead with our study and improve our lives immeasurably by educating ourselves about the truth of who we, who and what we are. Uh, another question for you is, uh, what do you feel about reincarnation? Now, you mentioned that in your book. Well, um, it, it, I, don't, I don't like all this stuff, but it, I, I sort of try to go with the evidence. The evidence for reincarnation is incontrovertible. Mm -hmm. We do live multiple lives. However, beyond this level of reality, there's no objective time. And according to the dead, the, you know, the upper level, the people who have reached level five or six and communicate with us, all of our lifetimes and all of history are all happening at the same time. Um, there's, there's subjective evidence 
I mean, that's what the dead tell us. But and there's a there's evidence that's true. Um, sometimes, rarely, there'll be a bleed through from one lifetime to another. Um, I've, I've heard people talk about it. People who are you know normal, credible people talk about it. Uh, and and in addition, uh, Brian Weiss, who is the pioneer of past life regression therapy, you know, you've got a, a phobia or an illness or something in this lifetime, he'll he'll regress you to where that problem started in a previous lifetime, and just remembering the, the event will get rid of the problem. And I, I've had it happen to me, so I, I know it works beautifully. But when he couldn't find the cause in prior lifetimes, he started progressing people to future lives, and he would find he could sometimes discover that a future lifetime was causing a phobia in this lifetime or some other issue, which makes your eyes cross when you think about it. But that's what the science tells us, and that's what actually seems to be happening. Now, going back to the electronics and everything of it and, and the ways of communicating, uh, Steve's grandmother, when she was alive, she, she obviously knew, as I told you previously, um, uh -huh. that we're, we're paranormal investigators, ghost hunters. Um, and as a joke, she turned around and said, when I die, I'll come back and prove it to you, <laughs> if, if, it's, if it's real, yeah. Uh -huh. And... Um, for a good three to six months after she died, um, our TV would would turn over, yes. um, and the remote control would be on the coffee table. Yep. The sky would turn over. Uh, the sky would turn over. You know, the um, sky would turn over and uh, onto another channel, and you'd actually. I don't think we actually saw the numbers go, did we? Sort of like one oh one. It just went onto another channel, um, and uh, a couple of times the TV would turn off. It never turned on. <laughs> yes, yeah, but, that, that's what they do. I, you know. be, because they're energy beings, it's very easy for them to mess with electricity. Mm -hmm. um, they they frequently will change channels, turn TVs on, or turn music on, or turn them off, and um, do this just to let us know they're there. Um, I I talk in the fun of staying in touch about my brother-in-law who was very very powerful being after he died and and the things he did with like electricity yeah. but it's they'll they'll blink the lights they'll they'll do sometimes there are people um who say that their their loved one is sufficiently powerful that whenever they walk along a highway uh the lights above them will blink out yeah which is very inconvenient for the city people who then have to replace those lights but that seems to be they don't care about that apparently We've got two more questions. Yeah, a uh, couple of more questions we have in the uh, chat room for you. One reverts back to the reincarnation, but we'll come to that in a moment. What do you think about the spirits that were alive 200 years ago? Can they contact us? The well, connection. I think, I think we're looking on the ghost hunting side of it, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, they're, yeah they're, and, and those, that's an important distinction. It seems to be the case. As we, it's a, death is a natural process, but we don't realize that, partly because, you know, both our religion and our science have let us down so badly. Mm -hmm. we, we're, we're basically clueless when we leave our bodies. Fortunately, there are loved ones who come for us and who escort us to the levels, you know, to which we're suited after death. Yeah. If we, but our, our, so our vibratory rate at the point we've left our bodies is already raised. We, we, we are no longer at the same low vibratory rate we were at when we were here. But there we are out of our bodies. We have no idea what's going on. And um, our, our people around our deathbed are crying. They're upset. We want to comfort them. You can't do that. If you remember nothing else from this evening, please remember, do not attempt to contact or talk with the living after you have left your body and, and the body has died because all you do then is lower your vibratory rate. You can no longer see your deathbed visitors who've come to escort you and you can make yourself into an earthbound being and be that way for centuries. It doesn't seem like time is passing apparently to these beings. They have no idea in some cases they're dead. They just, they just think weird stuff is going on, but they go about their, their routines. People will say, Oh, there's this woman who appears in my kitchen and then she walks through the wall. Well, in her lifetime, that was a doorway. And in her mind, in the, in the, in the reality she still lives in, it's still that same day she died and it's still a doorway. So those are the people who, if you are a ghost hunter, you are trying to rescue. Yeah. That, that seems to be a common way people become earthbound. Mm -hmm. Those people you still can contact. And in fact, they seem to react much more readily to 
people who are either living or just have died than to people who have long been dead and try to come for them. I mean, their loved ones are still trying to get their attention, yeah. but they need your help as a living person to say, look around, don't you see the people you love, and, and try to get them to raise their vib vibration to the point where they can see the dead. Yeah. The, but So those people you can reach. Someone who died 200 years ago, even if they're your ancestor, there's no loving connection. So if they've completed their transition yeah. at the at the present state of our technology, there isn't a good way to communicate with them. It's as if you 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 don't have their cell phone number or something, yeah. and I'd they don't say, have you. Mo most of the English, I don't know about the American ghost hunters, but most of the English ghost hunters, they they'll probably go to a place, say for instance, that's got the ghost of Queen Anne roaming around or said to be roaming roaming around. So they'll go and find out whether that's true or not. Or you know, from way back in um, Henry the Eighth's day, or something like sure. that. Sure. You know, so that's that's the sort of thing um, that uh, English ghost hunters are looking for. You know, when they say that it's haunted by a cavalier or something like that. Yeah, that's great. You know. Well, you're very fortunate <laughs> that you have these interesting, very ancient people that you yeah, can be so, with. Um, going back to the reincarnation, um, Andy's trying to get it round in his head that if there's if if there is reincarnation and after death communication, what is actually re re reincarnating? Do you know? Or I've noticed in your book you refer to others, um, publications. What seems to be the case is that we our, our multiple lives are aspects of our eternal minds. They're, they're us, but they're, they're like fragments or aspects of us. What One... A very high level being, a sixth level being who was channeled in the first path of this, of the previous century mm -hmm. said there is reincarnation, but you cannot possibly understand it while you're it, while you're in bodies. It doesn't happen the way you think. The easiest way to think of it is that you are a vessel out of which each lifetime is dipped and back into which each lifetime is poured. So that's kind of how I think of it. Um, it also seems to be the case, just anecdotally, that you can be living a new Earth lifetime and still be there. Um, one one communication that happened in the early part of the 20th century involved someone saying, you know, uh, to someone who recently died, uh, well, have you seen Aunt Martha or someone? And he said, well, yes, actually, I'm looking at her right now, but she's sitting on a bench and she's really not able to communicate with you because she's having an Earth lifetime. And that made my eyes cross to think of. <laughs> but time being so different there, it's quite possible that, in fact, you could you could do that. You could be in two places at once. Yeah. It just is distracting, apparently, to do that. Now, um, Ghost Rider um, asked a few questions back. Um, do animals do the same thing? Animals are of a different class. Uh -huh. um, there, there seem to be species-specific group souls to which most animals return. Yeah. However, if an animal of any species has been loved by and has loved a human being, mm -hmm. that animal develops a distinct personality, believe it or not, and it goes to our afterlife levels and waits there for us. And we, so every pet you've ever loved is waiting for you. Every, my horse is waiting for me, and I know that. I had a communication dream from him. Mm -hmm. um, there, it, it, it could be a lion in a zoo. If, if somebody had loved that animal, that animal will be waiting and, and will welcome you. Okay, so going back to signs and stuff, um, you, you talk about synchronicities and numbers and dreams and coincidences. Um, what is it that we should be looking for? Oh, my goodness, there's so many things. Um, I, I, it's common now that we have digital, uh, you know, clocks. Mm -hmm. It's common for them to use digital clocks all on the same number uh, to uh, as signs. And they'll, it'll be specific to you. I think it's mostly our guides that are using these, and it's mostly reassurance. But I get 333, 444, or 555 almost every day. I can't catch them if I'm looking for them. But they have the ability to direct our attention at the right moment to the clock. So you'll be working on your computer. Everything will be fine. You'll be busy. And all of a sudden, you'll notice that, that you glanced up, and it's 3.33. And um, it, it, that's, what they, that's what they do. 11.11 seems to be the one most reported. That's sort of the gold standard. But some people repeatedly will get a different set, and whatever is specific to your, you and your guides is what you'll get. 
If we're living multiple lives at the same time, are we actually reincarnating or are we just coming across our, our other self? It's very hard for us to contemplate the fact that time is not real. So it is us reincarnating, but time just doesn't work. It's not linear the way we think of it as linear. Um, the, the, the lives we have seem to be influencing one another. So we are, we are growing simultaneously in multiple periods of time. And we plan each lifetime based on the history. So this is, this is hard for even me to, to get. Even I've been studying this all my life. Once we've been through this lifetime, we go through a life review in which we get to relive the whole of our life exactly as it happened and also feel how we made every other person feel. And people tell us that's very hard to go through. We then have to forgive ourselves, which most of us manage to do. If we don't, then we punish ourselves, which you just don't want to get into. So learning to forgive, as Jesus said, learning for, to forgive while you're here is very important. But once we've then done that, we have playtime, but we hunger for spiritual growth when we're there, as you cannot imagine. If you could wrap every possible human hunger, whether it's thirst, hunger for food, hunger for sex, hunger for anything, if you could wrap all those hungers together, it doesn't even come close to how desperate we are for spiritual growth when we're there. And the only way to get it, just as if you, you know, you want muscles, big muscles, you have to go to the gym to get those muscles. So, you know, the all to your lifetime, all of the negative things are really just machines in the gym, opportunities for you to learn to sort of stretch your ability to love, stretch your ability to forgive. We need to look at them that way. They're not tragedies. They're important opportunities for growth spiritually. So that's what we do. We, we, we basically plan, if we had in this lifetime, for example, with forgiving somebody who had cheated us in a business deal or something, we will plan a worse such situation into a another lifetime which will it could be a future lifetime or it could be a past one we will plan that experience so that we will have another opportunity to to stretch that muscle in the way we need to do it in order to grow spiritually but it's hard to understand because we again think it has to be linear but time isn't linear so i I mean, there are thought experiments you can do with what this really means, which um, I, you know, another, another, if I come on your show, I'll help you go through it because there are some amazing things that may be true about what reality actually is and how it's all going to turn out. I think if. <laughs> <laughs> if. <laughs> no, I, I, this is, this is wonderful. Uh, great questions, by the way. I love it when people are really thinking about this. It's so important. Yeah. So, um, so you talk a lot about the quantum physics of, of it all. So how did you actually get into, you know, setting your brain into all this and, and, um, doing all this, um, research before you wrote the books? You know, you, you, you've obviously were fired up to do so from the, um, from the, uh, experiences that you've had. Um, is it something you wanted to find out for yourself whether when we die it's the end or, and that's it? Oh, yeah, I, it was all for me. It was yeah. real. It, it was. I mean, I knew there had to be something. I, I think it's harder to do afterlife research if you're still wondering. But those experiences when I was a child proved to me there's something there. So I never really doubted. I just wanted to know it. I, I was, and I, I started out craving to know. But very soon, I was so caught up in the wonder of what I was learning that it became an end in itself. It was like, it was like a drug. Because the more I learned, the more I realized that all these people were going to the same place. It was the physics was the same, the way they dressed, the th things they did, the process. It was all the same. So this was real. Mm. It was it was like discovering the new world. It was incredibly. It was the most fun you could have possibly imagined to do this work. Dave, sir, we've got Dave here. You got a really read through the lines of this trap room it's, it can be squinted up at times Dave said as far as he can see we are spiritual beings exper ex experiencing life through our bodies we focus on this life through our consciousness which if not local which is not local to the brain um, so how do you feel about that yes he's right 
Dave, you and I are kindred spirits. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's exactly right. Perfectly right. Perfectly right. So he's got it spot on, has he? He's totally spot on. Yes. All right. Well done, Dave. So, um, so yeah. So basically, um, as I say, you've you've written these books anyway. And as I say, <coughs> Steve mentioned before you came on that, um, as, as I said to you, I don't read books. Um, they have to really get me to for me to read them. I think I read this in three days. So, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, when I got the chance to read it, I picked it up. But and, and thank you very much, by the way, for sending us two copies. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm thrilled to be able to help. I, one for I, me, or I, one for them. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is this is the most fun anyone could possibly have to do this work, and and I'm just hoping that anyone who gets that book will feel inspired to you yeah. know do his or her own research. It's a yeah. it's a great journey. Now, obviously, your other book is also available. Whereabouts can you get these books if you're not lucky enough to win them? <laughs> They're from. You could get them on Amazon, both in Kindle and in um, in print. Okay. And you, you should be. Able, I mean, Amazon UK sends me royalties, so I'm sure that you can get them there. Yeah, I'm Amazon. sure we can. So, uh, and and your website is. Um, uh, My website Grimes. is R robertagrimes.com. Um, I also do the podcasts, and, and we're about to put a podcast page there so you'll be able to find out where they are. But okay. for now, if you just go to iTunes and Google uh, in there or search for Seek Reality with Roberta Grimes, uh, you can find the podcast. We have 170,000 iTunes wow. subscribers now. That's how many people. I mean, we gain 20,000 a month. People are desperate to know what's really going yeah. on, and we can know it. So it's time for everyone to really know. So, uh, as I say, um, it's such well, a massive subject. Yeah. Uh, would you would you say that uh, with all the science, whether it be quantum or otherwise, and all the spiritualism going around, that ideally we want to find that middle ground? What what we want to do is find the truth. Mm. Um, I I to me uh, there there is there are ways that religion can contribute primarily by getting rid of all the dogmas and just following Jesus. That would be a great start. Um, there are ways that science can contribute. Um, if we hadn't had all the work that's done in a number of fields, quantum physics and consciousness studies and others, uh, we wouldn't have we wouldn't be able to put it all together. So they they can contribute, but they've got to stop ignoring this huge valley full of information between them that neither has been willing to look at. So so yeah, we, they, we, it's time to just try to understand what's true without any dogmas at all. Uh, David Lloyd says we're living in a hologram matrix, um, yes, <laughs> which it, which we perceive through our senses, which is what David Icke's been saying apparently. So, no, the, uh, yeah, the, the uh, there's a wonderful book called The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot, and uh -huh. it's twenty some odd years old, but it's it's on the cutting edge still. Uh, I recommend it to everyone. Yeah. Uh, you recommend quite a few books in in this uh, second yes. book you've got um, for reading. And, uh, not only that are in print, but some that you can actually get free online as well. Yes. Um, which yeah. Which I should be Googling um, sometime this week. Um, but um, uh, one thing I will say is um, uh, you do mention the Avatar as well. You said it's a bit like the Avatar. Yes. <laughs> the astral plane and everything. So um, it's a bit like the film Avatar. The, the 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 analogy there is, yeah. um, you know, Jake is safe in a pod somewhere, mm -hmm. and his blue body. He thinks he's in his blue body having experiences. Yeah. Well, our minds are safe in eternal mind, but we think we're in these bodies in this alien place. This is just your 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 body is just a vehicle for you to explore uh, and have experiences and grow spiritually much more easily than you can in the afterlife. In the at in what we think of as the afterlife levels, but really they're the main levels where we live. In those places, life is too perfect. It's very difficult to grow spiritually there. We come here to do that. Yeah. Well, for those that um, uh, are interested in this second book, it tells you a lot about how you can communicate with others, uh, with, with the de uh, dead loved ones, which includes things like spine, automatic writing, um, and other ancient methods, and also mediums. Um, it also tells you about how they communicate with us um, by giving us signs like feathers and um, as well as uh, maps and TVs going off and on and what have you. Yeah. So, can, I, can I just ask, uh, when we talk, we're talking about consciousness, are we, are we talking about conscious, consciousness itself or are we talking about self-conscious and awareness? 
Well, see, th and that's a very good question. Our awareness is part of this larger consciousness. What we think of as our consciousness here is, is a limited subset of our true consciousness, which is part of eternal mind. As best I've been able to determine, we actually have the powers, the abilities, uh, uh, which are infinite, uh, of eternal mind. It's just that we don't, we, we can't experience them. But Jesus said, if you have as much faith as a grain of mustard seed, which is a tiny, tiny thing, you can tell this mountain to go throw itself into the sea and it will obey you. So he's telling us that we would have more access to our powerful eternal minds uh, if we believed, you know, if we stopped thinking we can't do it, we'd be able to do it. It's just, just very hard to believe it because we've not been able to do it before. Right, okay. Uh, we'll be back in just a moment. We're just going to play this uh, quick advert, if you don't mind, and um, we'll be back to you soon. Paranormal Intelligence Gathering Services Ghost Store is a one-stop shop for all of your ghost hunting gadgetry needs. Run by ghost hunters for ghost hunters, the shop is filled with all of the latest in investigation equipment shipped in from all around the world, from high quality digital dictaphones to EMF pumps, infrared illuminators to laser grid pens, CCTV equipment to data loggers. All of our equipment has already been imported so you can buy it safe in the knowledge that there will be no hidden costs. And with our postage promise, you'll never pay more than the actual postage price. So visit www.the-pigs.co.uk forward slash ghost store. Yeah, we're talking to Roberta Grimes over there in Austin, Texas, um, on uh, the fun of staying in touch with your loved ones. Um, her new book is The Fun of Staying in Touch, How Our Loved Ones Contact Us and How We Contact Them. And uh, she's on the uh, Skype with us now. Um, welcome back, Roberta. I'm so happy. We, uh, this is a lot of fun for me, by the way. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk with you all in the UK. This oh, is it's great. great. It really is great. Um, it's good to have you on. And uh, on the, the winter solstice that will be... I'm not sure about what it's like, what it is in your your country, but uh, we will be celebrating the winter solstice over the next few hours. So um, we will. <laughs> I, I was last night skyping to Australia, however, and there they were in full summer. So <laughs> there are places where the flowers are in bloom, just not where you and I are. No. Well, as I say, um, you you wrote this book, um, the fun of staying in touch, how how loved ones contact us and how we contact them. Uh, this came out this year, I believe. Yes, it did, this fall, actually. So what's next for Roberta Blinds? Um, does this follow on in sequence? Is there another book due? There's a third one to come, which will probably come out in 2017. Uh -huh. um, it's called The Fun of Growing Forever. Mm -hmm. And it's the hardest one for me to write because the evidence for the process... Well, I, I, maybe it's the hardest one to write. The evidence for the process of our spiritual growth is pretty abundant. But it's it it's harder to pull together and have it make sense because our 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 ability to understand while we're in bodies is so limited. Yeah. But on the other hand, I I also want to use it to give more details about the afterlife and and more details about the interface uh, that's always going on. Um, so we, it'll have elements of both books. But it's really its primary purpose will be as a guide because, of course, all this all this stuff we're talking about is really about how to live. It's not about how to die. It, that's a, that's almost an ancillary issue. It's about how do we make the most since we're here, <laughs> and since we went to a lot of trouble to get here. And and believe me, there are many more people who want slots on Earth than there are places to be. So uh, we're we we we're uh, we're lucky to be here. How do we make the most? out of this lifetime and get the most spiritual growth possible. That's what the fun of growing forever will be about. Right, okay. Well, it's been great talking to you, Roberta. It's been a lovely enlightenment, for what, what of a better word. <laughs> um, and uh, I look forward to reading the rest of your first book. As I say, I've read your second one. Um, well, if you have questions, or anyone does, um, our Grimes at robertagrimes.com, I answer emails. Okay. Always. Okay. Now we've get to, got to uh, pick the winner of our book tonight um, that uh, you finally offered for us. Uh, so, could you give me a number between one and twenty-seven? Sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. 16, one second. One second. One second. One second. One second. And it is. Who's it's Sue. 
Sue Harrison. Yes. Was that? Oh, Haggis Four. Oh, Haggis Four. Yeah, she's it's not actually in the chat room tonight, but yes, that's Sue. All oh, right, so we'll have to contact her and get her um her email uh, her postal address so I can post it off to her after Christmas. Well done, Sue Harrison. Um, but this book will be winging its way to you just after Christmas when the post starts off again. Um, so you're going to be writing your new book. What's going to be happening in between now and then, Roberta? Well, I also do novels. If you go to robertagrimes.com, uh, you can see that I've written, uh, I guess, five or six. And I'm, I, I'll be publishing one this coming year and then one the year after that that are part of a series that I'm doing to explore what we're learning about human nature and, and how we can use that to improve our lives. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, a, a multi-generational saga of a wealthy family, but I use it to uh, illustrate some important things. And actually, people have enjoyed the books. I'm enjoying writing them. So that's what I do for play. And I still practice law. I'll never get that right, I guess. I'll probably do it forever. All right. Andy's just said there's an irony, Sue, getting, Sue H. getting it. Uh, I must admit, she's recently lost, lost a loved one um, that we know about, don't we, Steve? Yes. So, uh, so yes, um, it is quite ironic that she she won that. Um, and uh, we've also he also says, no, don't stop. I'm loving it. <laughs> oh, <it's a> bit. <laughs> uh, so I'm loving it too. <laughs> yeah. So we definitely have to get you back yeah. on. Yeah. And, and anytime. And, and he's one of them people that. Uh, gets the subject and he and he likes to tear it to pieces and find all the little bits but at the end of the day he just loves loves, loves he, the, he uh, loves the co topic of conversation he does he? yes so he likes to find all you know find all the screws take them out and hopefully get them put back in again <laughs> well it, the thing is it's all good news that's why it's so much fun to talk about it's all true it's all reality and it's all good news and we have to do this research ourselves because until, you know, science gets a clue, and, and I'm not sure religions ever will, we're, it's up to us <laughs> to help yeah. one another to find the truth. Well, hopefully when we get you back on again, we can get into a bit more elaboration of it and, uh, and a bit more into the bones of it, if that's okay. Great. That would be wonderful. I look forward to it. Okay. Well, you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. and uh, Merry Christmas to everybody on your side of the pond. Yeah, and we're, what we'll do is we'll contact you in the New Year and sort out another date for your return. That's wonderful. I appreciate it so much. Big hugs to all of you. And to you. So stay in contact with us and don't be a stranger. I won't be. Okay. Bless you, dear. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Roberta. Well, that was Roberta Grimes. Uh, nice conversation, that. It was. Very, very buffly. So, you know what I mean? Um, very, very bodily person, isn't it? It is. Uh, you know, and to guarantee it, I must admit, is, um, is something to believe well, in. It is, but we're not exactly going uh, gonna to sue her afterwards, are we? <laughs> True. <laughs> so, um, no, it's, uh, I mean, what she says about the... But she didn't think religion will ever get it. Uh, religion will never get it because religion is about money. But this is it. Yeah. It's all about money and individual power, and that that isn't what religion should be about. Well, yeah. it's, well, maybe it is, but it's not what faith is about. No, this is it. So, but um, and war really currently. So, well, yeah, there's, there's been uh, more wars fight over over on religious grounds than than anything else. Yeah. So as, I, as so. I'm as I'm sure uh, Andy will tell you. Mm. He's anyway. looked a lot of them things. Yeah. Well, let's get this out of the way. Fed up of wading through the activities and events that other advertisers include? Find just what you're looking for at paranormaleventsforyou.com, your one-stop paranormal directory. Paranormaleventsforyou.com also offers... Banner advertising for only £10 per year. See our website for more details. ParanormalEventsForYou.com Your one-stop paranormal directory. You're listening to the KTPF Community Talk Show with Steve and Suzanne Taggart. Covering the supernatural, the paranormal and other strange phenomena to keep the paranormal friendly. Yeah, welcome back to the show. I do like that. I must have <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> Sorry, but I do like that. But, uh, but no, it was an interesting um, concept. And like David, David Lloyd said, uh, it's something that others believe in as well. It, it, it is. Uh, and, uh, and it's not just off the top of her head thing. She's, she's gone through... She's gone through she's a gone lot through of hard, hard work. Years of, odd years. Yeah, 40 odd years of, of going through people's statements, what mm. people saw, what people think they saw, and, and all that, and, and she's come to these conclusions. Really. Well, this is it. So, but um, if at the end of the day it is all pie in the sky and what have you, again, like I said, I've always said, when we die, if it's a brick wall from then on, there's no thought, there's no recollection, no nothing, then we're not going to have the the know-how or or we're just going to be it's going to be like full stop period that's it so we're not going to have the nonsense you know moan about it or anything like no, that I, I mean let's face it write down cards on the table it doesn't matter whether you believe in what Bert is telling you what whatever religion is telling you or what you think yourself At the end of the day if it makes you feel better until the point when you actually die, what difference does it make? Mm-hmm. As long as you're not doing anybody else any harm yeah. in, in following it. Because once you go, you're going to find out the truth one way or another. Oh, yeah. If there's nothing, then wh- whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, but, um, but as I say, it's... Uh, he says she's misrepresenting, misrepresenting, um, or misunderstanding quantum physics. Well, not really. I mean, some of it maybe, but at the end of the day, all science it doesn't matter whether it's quantum or not. They work a certain way, mm. and they don't take into account the spiritual. So no, the spiritual side of things, it's not the way science works because the spiritual side of it cannot be pinpointed. It cannot be. Uh, put under a microscope and go, yeah, that's the spiritual side. We've got, now we can take that into, into account. They don't do that because it can't be done. So all, all they can do is, is work on what they know. Mm. But as I say, it's, it's a nice thought, isn't it? It is. And she's a lovely woman. I like it. You know, isn't she? Yeah, she, I, I she's mean, so I mean, you've been you've been reading the books over the last couple of days, well, last week. Yeah, and it's made me think. And it, it's made you think. It's made you feel better about a few things. Yeah, whether it's right or wrong. But that's but that's what it's about. Mm. It's about getting some kind of understanding within yourself about things. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's it, finishing off the other book. We'll uh, make the same time. Hey. Yeah, I, I mean, TTGH said it, it's a theory she has. And ultimately, what else have we got when it comes to this side of things? None of us can prove it one way or the other. We can only go by what we found out what we've experienced ourselves and go for and make a theory from that. So that, that's, that's, that's what all any of us can do. Uh, and Dave, I said, who's on next week? Who's on next week? I'm about to tell you. Oh. Next week, we are talking on the 34th anniversary. Rendlesham. Rendlesham, yes. So, we just to let you know, um, we will be talking to Steve Mera. He'll be here live in the hub. And on the Skype, we will be talking to Peter Robbins about Britain's Ro- Rothwell. The Rendlesham, in- for- for- Rendlesham Forest in- incident, name given to a series of reported sightings of unexplained lights and the alleged landing of a craft or multiple crafts in Rendlesham Forest, Suffolk, England just after midnight on December the 26th, 1980. So that's what we'll be talking about. And also, um, we may touch on the latest, um, uh, the latest, um, 
what's the right word? Arguments, I suppose, that have been um, surrounding this issue. So, uh, you never know. <laughs> so, what do you reckon to that? I, uh, and we got a cracking one for the, for the first one of 2015. The first one. The first one. Well, what's the first one? Oh, Eric von Daniken. Here he comes. Here he comes. The man who's going to tell, put the world to, to rights. Hello, Andy. And tell well, us that Christmas, right. Father Christmas, doesn't exist. Don't you dare <laughs> say that. I watched Miracle 34th Street the other day, <laughs> and the judge says he does. Good evening, Andy. <laughs> Hello. So I'm in a community <laughs> in Glastonbury, so I can't speak too loud. It's not fair on the other people here. <laughs> okay. You're in a what in uh, Glastonbury? Say again? You're in a what? B&B. Bread and breakfast. Oh, right. Glastonbury. Are you? We're always come for the winter solstice. Okay. Ah. Yes. Go on, Where do I begin? Where do I start? Oh, God. God. <laughs> well, two points. I was sort of half typing up a bit as well. There are certain things to do with you can't hear me John make your ears <laughs> there are certain elements of quantum mechanics that are there are as it is and she's stated certain things in some of the stuff she's written in her book which shows she doesn't really get a grip of what quantum mechanics is saying for a start we're talking about the fact that you can only you have to accept all particles are in all states simultaneously until you observe them, and they will observe to be in a particular state. It doesn't mean they are in reality in that state. Now, that's something that she says in her book. She's saying that when you do observe... I'm not going to talk if John can put rude things like that on the screen. If you are observing something, she says it's as if you then fix it into a particular state, which it isn't the case. It's only in the, it only does that in your position as the observer. Now, this is a fundamental element of quantum mechanics. It's um, an uncertainty principle. It's the strongest, most heart, part of it, if you like. But she's... I'm afraid misrepresented it in trying to say that that somehow then fixes it into a certain state, which it doesn't. It's just your observation of the state mm -hmm. gives the impression of being in a certain state. Now, I mean, okay, you might say, well, what's that to do with what she was saying? But I mean, it's one of the ideas that underpins her understanding of quantum mechanics, which she then believes backed up some of the things she's saying in the parts of the book that I've read. But there's a fundamental flaw in what she's saying there. Also, the other thing that I was pointing out was she's talking about what's basically pure dualism. Phenomenalism, where you've got the mind and the body are completely separate from each other, running parallel until one occupies the other. That's fair enough. But quantum mechanics is also saying that we're talking about complete oneness, that everything is just the one thing. There's no duality whatsoever. She keeps quoting Jesus. Now, Jesus comes from a Judeo-Christian background, which, okay, we, we can say has been altered by um, later Christian faith, which it has been, but it's still a fundamentally dualistic position. The idea of God and Jesus. Now, whether the version of God she wants to talk about is different to the, the Judeo-Christian God, fair enough. But it's still a concept of God separate from the universe as its creator, as its evolver. She used that terminology in some parts of her book. So she's got two positions at the same time which are contradictory. So there but, you go. But isn't that duality? Yeah, you can't have both, Steve. You can't have one and the other. They're two different fundamentally separate concept positions. They're, they're contradictory compositions. Either you have oneness, complete single reality, whatever form that's in, or you have a duality of separate mind and body, separate God and separate reality. You can't have them both. And she's putting it, the way she's coming across, was she was proposing both at the same time, which you can't do. Well, well what, what she's saying is, is that the, the mind... Is a is, is is a one, but the, the body is separate because it, it's yes, separate. that's it's because dualism. it's because it's just a vessel. But that's fundamental dualism. It's a separation. Well, well some parts she's saying that, but other parts she's saying total monotheism, monism, monism, not monotheism, monism. Yeah, but one, it's, yeah, because there's the same point. The, the body's not the energy; it's what's in it, isn't it? Yeah, it's dualism. It's fundamental dualism she's been talking about. But another point she's trying to talk about monism. It's a different position. It's, it's contradictory positions. Either okay, put this way. Either you're sitting at your desk in your house now, or you're playing football at Wembley. You can't be doing both at the same time. 
I mean, okay, in some of her theorizing, there was possibly doing both in the same life. But you're one life now. You can't do both at the same time. You can't have both positions at the same time. You can't be both fast asleep and wide awake at the same time. You're one or the other. You, you can if you follow the uh, the idea that, that we're living many lives at the same time. Yeah, no, I just said that. <laughs> but you, you can't be awake and asleep at the same time. You person, Steve, the individual Steve that's there now, can't be awake and asleep at the same time. You're going to be depth of winter and height of summer outside your flat house at the same time. Tell that to my body. I know I slept last night, but I'm still picking tired. <laughs> That's fine. These are dualities. This fundamental dualism she's talking about. Okay. Do you, do you get it? She's talking about fundamental dualism. Yes. You've got two things in parallel, but at the same time, she's also having monoism. This idea of this oneness of what she was talking about before. She mentioned the idea of it all being you, the one thing. Yeah, but that, that would be the energy she was talking about. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. You can't have both. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. She's got both. You can't have both positions at the same time. Right. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm just reading something I've put on It's come up on here. Mm. Um. <laughs> he's reading something. What are you reading? I'm confused. What are you confused about? Well, uh, me and TTGH were talking about the Big Bang, uh, and he said this, this is a this is a big thing in America about Kurt Douglas. Some people say they can remember him dying. He's not dead. He's alive. He's about ninety odd. Yeah, but see, she's saying some people can remember him dying. That's just misremembering something. Um, yes. Okay. That that's that's the big problem. She's got a duality going. She's got two fundamentally opposing different positions at the same time, which is a bit of a problem for that kind of theorising. And I say the other thing is she's some of the most basic concepts of quantum physics. She's misre she's either misunderstood or misrepresented because it fits more with her thinking or her theorising, which you get sometimes. Well, that was Freud said, "Yeah, but nobody knows anything. That's for sure." Yeah, different timelines. We have a degree of acceptability of certain areas of knowledge. Otherwise, we'd just be saying, "Well, the world's flat and round at the same time." Nah. You know, uh, uh, that, uh, are uh, you absolutely? You know, do you feel personally that there's nothing that we can be sure of? Absolutely nothing at all. It, it, I'm asking. That's a question. Yeah, it strikes me at some point there she was she was talking about a multiverse. A multiverse. <laughs> When she's saying she's that we live, we live in many lives all at the same time. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the whole idea of a multiverse. It would be. It would be. But again, it's still the same problem of being a duality. A duality doesn't have to be two. A duality is a concept of more than one. I'm talking about the sort of philosophical terminology here. A duality is a reference to more than one. It could be billions. But it can't be the universal oneness of that comes from quantum mechanics, which is using the back of our argument. The fundamental theory of quantum mechanics is that we, everything is energy. It's energy that we cannot state categorically is in a particular state at any one time. It's continually in flux. It's continually, um, the uncertainty principle is the heart of that. It's, it's constantly changing from our perception of it. But it's still unified as one mass energy field, if you like. But at the same time, she's also talking about something that's fundamentally a duality. This concept of mind and brain not being in the same thing at the same time, or being bigger, or being separate, or then coming back into a reincarnate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what this, do you think is going to happen when you die, Andy? Uh, well, when this me, Andy, dies, it will be a case of being cremated and turned to dust. But right. the atom and energy spin will continue. That's where I agree with her. Now, right. I think she's she's. I mean, I'm not going into horrible detail, but she's misplaced the levels. Right. Shall we say that there is something beyond simple? Is that in her book or in her conversation? Well, it's just what she's talking about fits quite closely with the Vita Vedanta, which is a, a, a belief system, if you like, or if you want to call it, it's a philosophy of life that I personally very much adhere to. And quantum mechanics is the one that really is talking about essentially the same kind of thing. There is a, a oneness of everything that the energy within me sort of driving energy force, if you like, is the thing that will continue. That That's eternal. 
I must to admit, though, yeah. it's a lot to get into in yeah. in 60 minutes when yeah, you're uh, introducing the person at the same yeah. time. I mean, Dave's already saying no, that the state only exists when the observer looks at it. Exactly, but it doesn't. It, that's correct, but it doesn't fix the state simply by observing it. Now, one of the things she's quoting in the book suggests that she's saying exactly that. She's misquoting that very basic quantum uncertain principle, and Dave's put it correctly there. It's, it's in a state when the observer observes that state, but it doesn't fix it in that state. The state can remain on uncertainty. So, yeah, Dave's got that right, and that's where she's gone wrong, because that's what she tried to state in her book, because, you know, I've got a bit of it here. So what, so so what you're saying is when you look away, it changes. Yes. But when you it look changes, back, you look away, but it doesn't, you don't place. influence its appearance. It's how you observe it. Okay. It's constantly changing. It only appears, it's like, okay, it's like taking a photograph of a fast moving car. If you look at that picture, it appears the car isn't moving because it's moving. If you use a camera with a fast, very fast exposure, yeah, so the car would appear to be completely clear and stationary, wouldn't it, in that photograph? Yeah. But you know, when you took it, it was moving. By you taking a photograph of that car, you've not made the car stationary, have you? You observe it to appear to be stationary. Mm. But what she's saying was that you make the car stationary in the way she's put it in her book. That's a fundamental flaw, fundamental error in, in her understanding, because your photograph doesn't freeze the car in that position. It photographs the car in that position. It's your perception. You see the picture. It doesn't change the state of the car. The car is still moving at 50 miles an hour, almost the entire time. This is where she's gone wrong. The other thing I was saying to you is, and you've mentioned we talked this before, my my personal idea, and I say it comes from Bhaita Vedanta, which is a very anciently Hindu approach, is that there is this pure energy spirit within us. But that's the thing that reincarnates, is the energy. It's the level above consciousness. Now, right. she was talking about conscious self-awareness as being the thing that survives. Mind. Yet, no, she isn't. She's talking about conscious self-awareness. Right. You can say mind is consciousness. Now, pure consciousness is not con is not self-aware. It is consciousness. And beyond that is the pure self, the transcendental self, as Husserl, German philosopher, called it. It's the transcendental self. That's what reincarnates. It's the energy, if you like. It is, it is the electricity that's in your computer. If you imagine your body is the computer, your Conscious self-awareness is the computer program running. Consciousness is, in the case of a PC, is Windows. It's the fundamental program underneath. And then you have the electricity in the system. That's the Atman spirit. And I'll say to you, the Atman spirit is the one thing that does continue. So as soon as you turn your computer off, all the other things stop. Mm. The, the physical computer is still there. The program stops running. And Windows stops running. But the electricity is just not in, it's in the machine. It's still going through it. But it doesn't quick circuit. It's still present. That remains eternal. But what now about when you have to charge the computer up? No, because electricity is always there. Okay. <coughs> the electricity is always there. If your computer is still plugged in, the electricity is still running through the system. It's just not completing the circuit in your computer. Oh. It goes in and out again without completing the circuit. It's like all things. If you turn off a plug socket, the power's still there. It's just not going any further. Mm. But the electricity is still present. It's still there. So that's when people say that we are energy and you can't kill energy. Yes. We are energy. But that is all there is, is energy. This physical object stuff, this, this objectable physical reality. So what you're saying <laughs> is the energy will be there, but we won't be thinking to ourselves, oh, look, there's my husband over there. I'm going to go over to him. Exactly. Right. What's left behind is a ghost in the literal sense of an empty shell, if you like. Now, remember we talked before, but my, my own theorising about the idea of how it works is supposed to come up with it. fire <laughs> burning. <laughs> it's a fire burning. Remember we had a conversation about fires burning, that living persons are burning fire, right. but then the flame goes out, that spark goes out, but the embers still burn, yeah. still with the oppression of being alive, and I think that's what ghosts are. But they fade in time. Now, one of People said earlier on, and I quite agree. You're going to end, if everyone who's ever lived is still there, you know, your whole family for thousands of generations going back, they're going to all come and say hello. So, what? <laughs> okay, okay. So, what about these families that do come back and say, like, it's still a glowing ember? But it's a ghost. Yeah, it's a glowing ember. But what about it's these ghosts that we can contact and speak to? 
it's still a glowing ember of life. The spark of life no longer present, but it's still, you can still get warmed by the glowing embers of a fire, but the flame's not there, is it? Fine. It's not brilliant. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's just the imagination, but it's the best one I can make sense of at the moment. It's yeah. just a theory. T-T-G-H. Yes. Yeah, but, uh, I, mean, I mean, these glowing embers would still have, still have to have some form of consciousness to, to communicate. Mm. Yeah, but that's it. They still produce the heat. The flame's gone, but the heat is still present, isn't it? Yeah. Right. These some of the embers of a fire. There's no flame there. So you c- you're the saying that when we die, yeah, yeah, your grandmother or whatever, your mum's not waiting for you to say, "I'm here, darling," or whatever. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I, I don't believe that, because that would suggest the conscious self awareness continues forever. Right. Oh, I find that difficult to accept because it doesn't. Cause so you do what want about to when right. you get these moaning ghosts that have been running around and looking well, like the, earthbound and the grounded spirits? Um, mm. Yeah, grounded spirits and looking for their loved one or whatever. Even the ashes still burn, aren't they? Ash is still there. They're the dead, cold ash. If it's still there, it's still the dead, cold ash of a fire. It's still there. You, you, you do realise, if, if I come into contact with a spirit called Ash, I'm going to piss myself laughing. <laughs> 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 I'd say that it's not a brilliant analogy at all, but it's the best I can really come up with at the moment. That's your yeah. personal opinion, Andy. Says, yeah. No, really? I can't. Is it? I, can't, I haven't guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not my personal opinion. I know a lot of other people say the same. But I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, it's it's all about, <laughs> it, it's all about what gets you through. Yeah, of course, it's all about. I mean, I'm still yet formalising, but you know me, I like taking other ideas apart and put them back together. If they can put back together and they still work, then brilliant. But they were just holes. You might find you sometimes you might have a couple of screws that are, that you're sitting there thinking, where the bloody hell did they go? Yes, exactly. You know, I what love mean? a good theory, but. I mean, I will have to come up with my own stuff. I know I'll have to because then I can be shot down in face of everybody else. But then I'm probably the most regular guest you've had. I've been on six times already. Oh, what's that got to do with it? <laughs> my, my own theory is pulled apart and thrown, you know, thrown out the window and trampled all over quite happily. It's but not my, just it's not my fault your knowledge and font of, you're an oracle of information, you know, and that we can come to you yeah. and, and say, is a, is a, help. Is, is a, <laughs> as he said, he's an oracle of weird information. Yes, you know Thank what you. I mean? So, but All I'm saying is that I don't just sort of sit back and sit in the background and hide and just tear people's theories apart, you know, come and on. And we you give show. you a voice for you to well, come on and say, Well, we give everybody a voice if they want to come yeah, on. Yeah, But you go, you feed my ego, that's what you do. Thank you. You know what I mean? Feed <laughs> your ego. Well, thank you, Andy, for your input. Oh, thank you. That's quite all right. You get rid of me now, are you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. What do you mean, get rid of you? No, yeah, well, of course, tell me, you say, well, thank you for your input, and it means go away, hang up. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, that's why it's all right. All right, guys. I'll see so you again. It's nice yeah, to have good. your input. I just good. want to clarify just quickly, that's my two problems with her, was she was trying to propose two different fundamental positions at the same time and showed a certain misunderstanding of the nature of quantum mechanics. Okay. Okie dokie. Okie dokie. Read our second book. I'm going to, and it <laughs> seems as mad as the first one. But yeah, okay, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. See bye. you later. Bye. So uh, that was our Andy. So until next time, that have a very merry, merry Christmas. Yes. Okay. Don't um, get don't get too drunk and enjoy yourselves. Yes, and remember, if you've got any candles lying about, blow I, them out. Yes, blow them out there before was, you go to bed. But there was a a girl in the a young girl in the news today. She was obviously playing around and what have you, and um, swirling around near a candle, and unfortunately it caught her dress, and she ended up going to hospital. So please be careful, yes, guys. Uh, also, uh, not only that. Uh, so someone recently died from the same thing because they didn't, they left a the candle burning, didn't they? Yes. So as I say, please have a very merry Christmas. Enjoy yourself. We'll see you here next Sunday on the twenty eighth, hopefully. Um, come on, have a drink with us and uh, enjoy the show. Until next time, remember to keep, keep the, the paranormal, paranormal friendly. friendly. Good night, and God bless. Night, everyone. This is where it's at. That's better. Hello, Harry Price here. Good evening. 
If there's nothing myself and everybody else enjoy here on the other side, more is the sit back and relax and listen to Parasearch Radio with its paranormal news, views and reviews from across the UK and beyond. Make sure to find out more about them on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web, whatever they are, to keep up to date with all their broadcasts throughout the week. And I hope you enjoy them as much as we do over here. Hello? Is anybody there?